So quick look at storing oil, and then we'll, we'll come to the end of this uh, section. So it's stored, as I mentioned, because it's part of the supply chain. Um, and if you have storage as a company, sometimes you'll fill it up completely, but some, mostly you won't. You have it like 60 or 70% full as your standard. And maybe if demand is very strong, your, your stocks are going to drop a bit. And so there's a minimum volume required for the whole system to function. You have to fill the pipes, maintain your tank levels, supply to clients. Stock levels rise and fall according to economic activity and seasonality. And all companies plan ahead for demand changes through the year. So in the second quarter, they're building gasoline stocks for the um, summer, particularly in the United States. And in September, October time, they start to build heating oil stocks for the winter. So we see seasonal changes in stocks as a result of that. Um, oil producers, we've seen that when their price drops and goes through their cost of operation, they may well shut in some of their, their volume. But if we're a cheap producer, we might sell lots of volume to gain market share, reduce supply, try and manage stock levels. So we see activities from the different market participants. Um, and OPEC looks at stock levels. They, that's one of the things they look at. They also look at stocks divided by global demand and that gives them how many days supply. So days supply is, is maybe more key than stocks because if you have high stocks but good high demand, then your day supply is relatively comfortable. If you have high stocks and low demand, you've got very high day supply and that's what can be uh, negative for the market. Okay. You, know Sorry, when you're talking, you know when you're talking about storage and you have about 60-70% free capacity, um, I wanted to compare it earlier when you were talking about uh, if companies like BP and Shell, they own uh, vessels, for example, and then they will have that as their own business entity and then uh, charter out the vessels. Is it the same when it comes to storage? So if you have like 60 or 70% capacity free, could a company then outsource that storage to companies that don't have their own storage? Uh, there's nothing to stop them from doing that. But it's not um, common. It's not common. Yeah. Absolutely, they could well do that. I'm, I'm not sure because I'm not in that business how much that happens. If, okay. you, look at, if you look at ARA, ARA you have, uh, the inter, you've got the major oil companies that no doubt uh, you know, refinery owners and they have storage tank farms alongside and you have independent storage, tank tank, pack tank, oil tanking, Vopac, there's three companies there um, and there's probably more and they are, they specialize, that's their business in tank farms and, and uh, having companies hire their tanks for, for storing oil. So I don't know to the degree that oil companies uh, who have their own operation, like a major oil company, leases out spare storage when they're not using it. But I wouldn't be surprised if they do it because they're, they're tasked with maximizing um, profits, I should think. And I, and I should think that the thing is about when the opportunity comes around, which we'll look at in a second, for storing oil, those companies with spare capacity can take advantage of it. Right, so it makes sense to keep the, the spare capacity rather than rent it out. But, and then that also depends on what's going on in the next six months to a year. Oh. Yeah, yeah. But for example, in COVID, you wouldn't have wanted to rent out that space. You wanted to have kept that storage space. Because the upside to you is probably greater. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Good, good one to pick up. Um, I have a quick question regarding storage. Um, is there such a market where... Uh, let's say one participant store uh, location A, some products, and uh, leave it there to then swap some uh, product or in a location B. So Whereas it doesn't it doesn't deliver the product in location A, but he store it there to be sold or for, with somebody else, and they said that he he makes this product available for the market there, but he, he gets sourced. Uh, with product that is stored in lo location B. And, and I can see the, the rationale behind that. So say you have some storage in Singapore, some storage in West Africa. Correct. Um, okay. You have a lot of, st you have stocks in West Africa. Yes. But you'd prefer 
So you have stocks in Singapore because you want to deliver it to clients in Singapore. That's correct. So you, you can pick your stocks up from West Africa, put it on a tank and ship it around to Singapore. Or you could have a, an arrangement with and do a swap with another company and they give you Singapore products and you give them West African products. Exactly. So that's such a market. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, there's not an active market that I've heard of, but again, I would, I would uh, think that you see traders are always looking for opportunities. Okay. Right. And so a, a trader with the oil product in the right place may well agree to doing that. Okay. The only reason I think they might not do it is because the trader that has product in West Africa, but wants it in Singapore is because the Singapore market's attractive. So who are they going to find to say, Oh, okay, you could have my Singapore product. And where are you giving me product? West Africa. Hmm. You know, it's gotta be, it's gotta be mutually beneficial for it. Yes. To happen. Yes. Okay. That's something possible. Then. Yeah. And, and that's where arbitrage comes into play. Got if it. the Singapore price is $10 over the West African price, and it costs you eight dollars a ton to move it, or eight dollars a barrel to move it on, on an oil tanker. That's when the arbitrage kicks in. Okay, excellent. But, but you'd actually have to move the product. Okay. But that's a good, yeah, good point. So if we're going to use uh, storage and make money out of it, we need conditions to be right, and the conditions are, are as follows: um, the market structure must be good, prices, backwardation, or contango. Um, but what we want is a steep contango and we want that contango to be greater than the carry cost. So the cost of carry is the cost of owning the material over a month. So we need to buy it. So let's, we've got to borrow the money to buy it because money costs, even if we use our own, we've got to factor in what is the cost of that money, the interest rate. We have to insure it and then we have to pay for the storage. Okay. Um, but the contango must be steep enough to make storage profitable. And, and so what it helps to do is to take excess product off the market, prevent the price collapse un until the storage is full. So when the contango is very steep and it's greater than the carry cost, we can, we can do exactly that. We can buy the product and if we have storage available, put it into storage and make money because we can sell the next delivery month and the differential between our buy price and our sell price is greater than the cost of holding the material over a month. Um, and so here's, it's, it's a little, it's a little uh, example for you. So the carry cost is $6 and 50. And here we have, we can pay spot 602 for March and we can sell the, um, April at 6.09. So that's $7 di differential between where I buy it and where I can sell it in a month's time. And it's only, it's going to cost me $6.50 to hold for a month. Okay. So I fill the tank up with, uh, with fuel. And so let's just, let's have a look. So in this case, it's not because we've got a $3 discount between March and April, and I need to cover my $6.50 cost. But the market's dropped. Okay, uh, and now I have a spot price of 602 because March futures are just going off the board. That's the same as the, the spot market value and next month value is 609. So I now have a $7 discount. So I buy diesel, ULSD, put it, pay for the storage for one month, pay 602 to buy it, sell futures at $7. Okay, so I'm, my revenue is seven, my cost is six, um, six dollars fifty, and I'm making fifty cents. Okay, um, is everyone comfortable with that? When when all the online storage is full, as happened in two thousand nine, two thousand ten, and even in more recent times, there's nowhere to put the product, and so the price continues to drop. The contango gets steeper and steeper, but in those times. The demand for shipping is quite low because the global economy is slow. We've got too much product around for a reason. And so tankers are available and shipping rates are very cheap relatively. So go back to world scale or go back to time charter. It's now cheaper to charter a vessel. We don't have to pay for it to go anywhere. All we want to do is fill it full of fuel and park it outside, um, outside Rotterdam. 
and so the next level is the cost of floating storage and that might be say twelve dollars a month rather than six dollars fifty a month but when the contango has gone down to minus 13 you see traders buy product charter vessels and put it on the vessels okay now this is a little exercise and and i'm going to pass on it simply because time is going by and i need to we need to, to keep moving on um, but what, what I suggest is if you have a look at it, uh, it's very straightforward. And um, so I'm going to talk you through it without, without actually doing it. Okay. So we're looking for a contango to be big enough that, that um, we can store the product. So what we need to do is we can buy the product at 432.75. And we can, this is prompt, prompt month now, low sulfur gas or future is diesel. It's the same specification. We can sell the future contract at 441.75, which is nine dollars. Okay, um, have I done that right? Okay, yeah, and I've and I've got the six dollars fifty a month, so I've got we've got potentially lots of money to make here. But I need to ah, oh, that's a nine dollar diff. Um, yes, that's storage costs, but I, I need to factor in the cost of buying it. So if I pay 432.75 per ton, then I I've got a factor in the cost of that. So 3% of that divided by 12 would be my monthly cost of ownership. I'd add that on to $6.50. And if it's less than $9 significantly, I can go ahead and, uh, and, and um, do my storage play. Um, so that's, there's the challenge. And I hope that you can, you can have a go at that and at, at your leisure. Let's not do it right now. It's, uh, sorry, I know you'll cut for time here, but in terms of uh, futures trades, if you're a trading company, what percentage of your trades should be futures and spot? Because, for example, during in April when the price went to zero, even a negative, uh, Hinlong, which was obviously a huge, huge supplier, they went bankrupt because they sort of overshot it with their futures. Um, what what would you recommend is sort of the sweet spot in when to engage in futures and when to not, or like the the amount your trades engaging in futures well look each each this is this is certainly something to address to the, the guys that are coming on because they are experienced physical traders both chris in the next balance this week and next week each company is different each company has a set of risks they take on board so imagine a trader starts with a zero trading book zero sheet they might have assets to trade around, in which case they're trying to optimize their assets. But maybe a trader is just starting with absolutely nothing, has to start decide what to do. If they're hedging, they're just using their futures to offset exposure. So wherever mm. the where the one goes, the other. You know, if you lose a hundred thousand dollars on your physical, you should be making a hundred thousand dollars on your futures. So there's no choice about how much futures you do. You have to use futures to hedge the risk, and it has to be the equal volume. So, uh, you, so you need to think about the context in which you're using futures. Now, even if the price goes to minus $40, because it's a hedge, the physical has also gone to minus $40. You've lost a lot on one and you've made a whole lot on the other. So it, it, it's, I, what, I, what, I, um, what I hope I'm gonna ask you is watch, you know, watch what, how these guys are describing what's going on and hopefully You'll, you'll have the answer for yourself. Now, now Hin Leong, I'm not exactly sure why they, they, um, they went bankrupt, but maybe they were overhedged or underhedged. Maybe there was a speculative element in what they were doing. I think they were overhedged. I think it was about $3 billion worth of futures that they were overhedged. Not yeah. COVID happened. And, yeah. and that's a market risk. You right. could describe that as a speculation. Okay. So it's... Uh, you need to have a forensic look at what Hin Leong had and then decide if they were just pure hedging or if uh, there was an, an added element of activity. Yeah, it's a, it's a great case study. It's a great case study to look at. Yeah, and it will be for a long time to come. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so we could go to floating storage once. And as far as I know, there's always been available shipping capacity at times when the market is stressed that we can put product in storage and find the next floor of how steep that structure can go in the contango is about um, the cost of floating storage. Okay, different types of inventory, 
um, what are we doing? We are we are holding stocks for various reasons. The main one is operational, and that's a very high percentage of of of, uh, of what's going on. Um, so seasonal is part of operational. Okay, um, blending is operational because the refiner needs tanks in which to continue the process. These two bits, breaking bulk, we might import a cargo of um, of diesel into Rotterdam and split it up into barges and deliver it to clients. And I, I bought a huge oil tanker load and I'm selling, distributing to clients. So I got a, a, a margin uplift in, from the point of view that, that my, my retail clients pay me more than I paid wholesale for my bulk. Um, but I could be looking to export a whole lot because Singapore fuel oil is at a high price and, and say Rotterdam fuel oil is really, really cheap. So I'm, I'm buying different parcels and bulking them together to put on an oil tanker, ship it out to Singapore. So maybe I'm increasing bulk, but there's an arbitrage opportunity. And I, I might have online storage and floating storage. So some of this is necessary because it's part of the business. Some of it is opportunistic because of, um, and of course, the inventory type here, of course, is the, the, uh, the, um, the carry play is not in here, but so maybe I'm, I'm taking advantage of the structure and um, storing some more oil there. Okay.